Hi everyone, my name is Adrienne and I'm going to be giving you your chapter 17 um, presentation on material property correlations. So first things first, um, what are material properties? So within this first slide you can see exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about material properties. So we're looking at the mechanical properties, dealing with strength and stiffness, thermal properties, obviously looking at that melting point and the thermal conductivity, optical properties, electrical properties, um, physical properties, really looking at its density, and then also the, ma the magnetic properties and chemical properties. So all of these properties are things that engineers um, need to take into consideration um, when determining exactly what type of material they want to use for the various project that they're cre creating. So obviously the importance of material properties for engineers, as I was briefly discussing, is just better understanding exactly what properties make up the material in which they're going to use. Um, this is especially critical when we look at engineers creating various um, buildings or structures, um, such as bridges and whatnot, because ideally, depending on where you are building, um, there's a lot of factors that they need to take into place and therefore need to be come up with the best material that is going to do the job and keep that structure um, strong and have its ability to be used, you know, continuing on throughout the years. Um, the biggest example I know of is obviously when you look at climate and look at severe weather, um, there are certain areas of the of our country that are more susceptible to severe weather um, due to its location. So you think about Florida specifically, um, the structures and buildings there really have to be able to withstand hurricane weather. So strong winds as well as strong rain and, you know, the possibility of water kind of coming through. Um, you also can think about, you know, the areas in which are con considered Tornado Alley. You know, those areas there obviously have to be able to kind of hold true to dealing with the possibility of a tornado touching down and kind of those high wind situations as well. So all of which engineers do have to take into consideration when selecting the material which they're going to use. So obviously a good engineer would routinely seek the needed property from reference sources. Um, so the examples they gave obviously in the book were that they could look it up on the internet or use a handbook or guidebook in a sense. But there's always, there are times when the needed property is not available. So the idea is what do engineers do at that point? So this is ideally where property correlations come into play. So ideally, property co correlations are used when a material has an unknown property value. So you're not sure exactly how what the strength of it is, or you don't know what the melting point of it is um, when it comes to looking at the type of material that you're using um, as far as property. So this is when engineers compare that material and that property with a known materials property value. Um, and that kind of at least helps provide a starting point for where it would fall on a correlation chart to better determine whether it's something that they would want to use or not want to use. Um, I think a big part, although they didn't say this in the book, um, what really came to mind when reading this was this would really come in handy when you're looking at um, kind of eliminating high cost materials and looking at additional materials to use at a lower cost, but still have that same strength or melting point that you're ideally looking at getting. So this really blended well with chapters six and eight, which were dealing with estimating um, slash data checking and also in chapter eight with the ratios. So the correlations are ultimately found when looking at the atomic level bonding of the elements. So kind of bear with me at this point because this was where it got a little tricky with my understanding. Um, just a lot of science with this. <laughs> so the picture shows how two elements are kind of coming together. And ultimately what happens, I'll turn the page then, is the bonding process happens when two elements atoms, um, they kind of start at a point and as you move them closer, there is 
you know, that point where there's that attractive force that comes into play. But then as you even move them closer still, there is a point where a repulsive force um, comes into play. So ideally, the elements are bonded when the force, when the attractive force and repulsive force are at an equal balance of zero. So when they're at that equilibrium is how they determined it. Um, and that's when the elements are become bonded together. So ideally then what happens continuing on is there's a net potential energy curve and they kind of described it as there's like a depth of the well. I'm not quite sure, but I have a feeling it kind of means like the strong, the greater the net potential energy curve is, you know, obviously that would correlate with um, stronger melting points, stronger materials um, when looking at strength and whatnot. Um, so ideally that's kind of where that correlation comes through. So further on, they talked about there's a strong correlation between, you know, a lot of the materials and the elements in which um, based on their net potential curve. So when you look at strength and melting point, there's a, there's a lot of correlation with those as well as elasticity and melting point, um, elasticity and strength. Um, just continuing on to look at those correlations between the two. So in this one, you can see that there's, you can see the exact whole graph or plot basically um, that shows the strength versus the melting point. And for most of it, it kind of sticks true to um, the greater the strength, the higher the melting point. But you do have a few of those exceptions to the rules that don't always follow. Um, so you can see down here, this one has a pretty decent strength compared to others but a very low melting point. So obviously not something that you'd want to put in a structure that's going to deal with a lot of heat, um, whether from outside forces or not. Um, but also when you consider that if there's a chance, you know, obviously when you build structures, there's always a chance that fires can occur. So obviously that's not the type of material you would want because if a fire were to happen, obviously with a low melting point like that, there's a good chance that, you know, the fire company wouldn't be able to get there in time to kind of save the building or structure that you have. So you can see they also then showed in these two on these two pages um, the tables in which they show the correlation um, using kind of numbers a little bit better, show the strength versus melting point um, and their correlation there with certain elements, as well as looking at the thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity on the next page here. Um, so again, it's just showing you those correlations um, in a different way versus the line plot we saw. So as far as implementation into the classroom, um, obviously we had a discussion in the class, so I was able to get a few ideas from there. Um, but I was also able to kind of gather a few ideas from the internet um, that would kind of work with whether it would be um, kind of an intermediate elementary level or even beyond that. Um, with middle school and high school level as well, depending on what you're teaching them. So obviously we talked about electrical safety as being a good one for primary students and kind of talking about, you know, how the wires should not be exposed um, within the electrical cord, you know. So looking into that, um, we also kind of talked about the solar oven experiment um, and just looking at the different materials that would kind of help provide, you know, not only get the sunlight, but be able to hold that heat enough to melt the marshmallow and chocolate together to create the s'more without actually building a fire. Um, additionally, I also found the other two projects that I've listed here. Um, the one deals with um, deal looking at roofs and the materials used to um, create a roof that would be waterproof specifically. Um, but you can also look at different ways that the roof would kind of, uh, whether it's provide, kind of get that solar energy or be able to kind of hold heat versus kind of absorbing it all necessarily and whatnot. And then the last one, which I thought was kind of unique, was the heat loss project. So looking at thermal energy within homes, and this really kind of stuck out to me a lot um, due to the fact that I do work in an urban setting in a high poverty area. Um, I think this project would be a great one for kids to kind of look at because depending on where they're living, um, you know, sometimes a lot of times when you're living in a city, you're not always living in the most 
um, lavish homes that are up to date. And so a lot of them might be dealing with, you know, a lot colder winters within their home, despite having heat, they might not be able to hold the heat as well. Um, so kind of looking at ways that they could help their home um, hold in some of that heat so that, you know, obviously electric bills kind of go down a little bit more so, or just being able to hold the heat that you're able to pump out, um, which I think was kind of cool because it kind of brings apart that real world application to a project um, for these students. So obviously I'm sure there's a lot of other um, projects that a lot of you are thinking about when it comes to your specific grade level, um, but those were just a few of the ideas that I came up with. So I hope you enjoyed.